So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, running through a kind of schedule where Monica is going to talk to everybody about the, the, the legal technicality practical side of furloughing um, and Faye and I are then going to talk a little bit about the trends that we've observed around furloughing um, and also a little bit about a white paper that we're creating about the innovation generally that we're seeing coming out of the COVID-19 period um, and then we're going to hand over really to our, our, our star speaker of the day, Jeremy who um, founded his business, which I'll let him talk about in more detail, but he founded his business um, in, a, in a different kind of period of crisis, I guess it would be fair to say, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, but but can, can really talk in a lot of detail about the experience of trying to um, bring a business to life in a, in a period of uh, challenge and what led him to start that business and the challenges he faced, which we just felt had real pertinence for um, the challenges that people are facing at the moment. So... I think that's one o'clock, so we'll kick off since there's lots of people who've jumped on early and are eager to start. We've got a couple of questions already in the Q&A, so I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at that. Um, can I possibly at this point hand over to you, Monica, in order to just talk to people a little bit about the, the background, just to introduce yourself and then talk to us a little bit about the background picture um, uh, around what's been going on. And I just need to do one thing here, which is to share my screen um, and put this up, which is something that we're putting up for all of our um, webinars um, in terms of how we are funding these um, programs that we're bringing to you during this period. So they're being very generously funded by a combination of funding um, between the European Union and, um, and the government, which is what's allowing us to bring you this content. Um, at the moment. I'm not managing to pull that slide up right now, but um, we'll pull that up later in the presentation. So Monica, enough from me. Over to you, just to give us a little bit of the background of um, furloughing, please. Okay. Uh, my name's Monica Beckles, and I'm the uh, founding director of a company called Inside Advantage, which is an HR consultancy and performance improvement business. Um, so, as Helena said, just to give you the key points about furlough and how they would relate to the key parts that we're talking about today. Um, as most of you know, the furlough scheme was introduced in March to help businesses who were suffering as a result of the pandemic. Either they didn't have any work for their staff, their business had been you know, adversely affected by the um, pandemic and the reduction in business across the UK and the globe. And what the government realized was that if they didn't do something, then the likelihood is there's gonna be a, a colossal number of people made redundant as this pandemic continues. They introduced this scheme and it was designed for employers to keep their employees, put them on furlough. We'd never heard of that term. It's a temporary leave effectively. It's commonly used in the USA. They can put their staff on furlough leave and retain them with the hope that when the pandemic reduces and we can all go out and get back to normal, they can just bring their staff back in, they can hit the ground running, start to you know, be productive straight away and then the economy starts to improve. That was the basis and the justification for the scheme. And how it works is that an employer can put an employee on furlough leave that was on their payroll or there was a real time submission for them on the HMRC payroll software up to the 19th of March. It was originally the 28th of February, and that was then extended. And they, they've given businesses the option of bringing employees back that maybe they had made redundant before that date to furlough them. And as I said, it's all designed so that businesses can hit the ground running when this scheme ends. So that was the purpose behind the scheme. The government contribute 80% of an individual's salary. Some businesses are only paying their employees that 80% and others, it's optional. They have the option of topping it up to 100%. But for an employee, it's 80% typically that the employer can claim back from the government. Now, that is the individual's wages up to a cap of £2,500, minimum pension contributions and NI contributions for that individual. The scheme is for employees. So... I mean, an employee on a zero hour contract, fixed term, you know, any employee on your payroll, as of the 19th of March, the employer has the option and it is optional. They do not have to do it. They can refuse to do it. There is no commitment on them to do that. They may decide to lay the individual off or go ahead with redundancies, but this gives them the option 
to retain that skill within their business for when this is all over. Now, the scheme originally was due to run until the end of June. You may have heard that yesterday it's been extended until the end of October. The government has committed to no change to the scheme up to the end of July, but from August to October, they're looking for employers to make a bigger contribution. And what, although they haven't released information yet, and it's expected at the end of the month, the expectation is that they will reduce their contribution to 60%. So the government will only pay 60% of the individual's wages with the expectation that the employers will make up the other 20% to take them to the 80% that they're currently on now. So that's all what people believe is going to happen. It hasn't been announced yet, but that is the expectation. So the scheme, as I said, just to reiterate, runs till the end of October, but expect changes from the 1st of August uh, to be announced, but we'll keep you up to date. Now, one of the key things in the scheme that needs to be touched on when we're looking at individuals being creative, innovative, and doing things in their downtime is if you have been, if, if an employer places an individual on furlough, normally in a contract of employment, there is a, an express or implied term for the individual to be loyal and faithful to their employer and not work for a competitor or other business during the time that they're contracted with that employer. And most furlough agreements would, ha would have some stipulation to restrict an individual from working for another company while they're on furlough leave being paid by their employer. That would normally exclude any essential services that are going on now to help with the fight against the virus, but it would definitely come into play, you know, if you were thinking about working for a competitive business or a business in the similar sector. So if you are thinking about doing something while on furlough leave, it's absolutely essential for you to first of all, check your contract of employment and see if there is any clause in there. But I would suggest that you have the discussion with your employer to see if you can work for another company during that time. And if it's going to cause any, you know, sort of conflict between uh, an employer and employee, because that is not what's required right now. Everybody needs to be collaborative, pull together and be ready to hit the ground running. So you cannot work for your employer during that time, but you can subject to your contract of employment and your employer's permission work for another business. So that's the essential parts of the scheme. Um, we're going to have Q&As at the end. So if there's any more information that people need on that, happy to answer any questions. But um, yeah, that is the main part of it. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And obviously, one of the things that we're trying to do at Sussex Innovation for our members and for other people who we're reaching out to through our digital offerings is trying to keep them abreast of how this is developing as soon as it's developing. So Monica, your view is that it's most likely that around about the 1st of August, it's going to become more clear in terms of that split between government funding and... I think at the end of this month, I think the end of this month, they said okay. they're going to give more um, detail on the changes they've implemented. But there was suspicion even before yesterday's announcement mm -hmm. that they're going to reduce um, the amount of their contribution. They're also making the scheme more flexible, which is a really, really good thing, because a lot of employers although they weren't able to keep their employees on their books full time, really wanted to be able to say, okay, I can give you half, you know, work half the hours and um, I'll furlough you for the rest. But the scheme says that you have to do it for a minimum period of three weeks as it stands, which means once you furlough that employee, even if you have a desperate, you know, something that you yeah. can do that would be good for the business, good for them, you just can't do anything. You have to wait until the end of that three weeks. So as I said, details to come, but, the flexibility we're hoping will enable businesses to say, okay, come back part-time, but we'll still furlough you for half the week and share the cost of that with the government. Okay, I'm sure that'll be great news for a lot of our members who would just like to have that, like, both to keep them engaged, but also to have them working on the, you know, the key yeah. things. So that sounds yeah. brilliant. So we will keep you posted on, on, on updates to that. I am just going to come to you with a couple of questions now, Monica, because we've already got quite a few questions coming okay. in. Okay, okay. Steve, um, just a quick question for you, Monica. Um, does an employer pay NI when people on, are on furlough and other costs such as pension? Yes, everything that the employee would normally get, they get apart from, there are certain things which are in, excluded, so discretionary commission, discretionary bonus, all of that is excluded. But any contractual um, payment that they get 
has to continue. So that includes any pension contribution that the employer is making. You can claim the minimum level contribution back from the government um, and any NI that accompanies that individual's wages, that can also be claimed back. Great, thank you. And then there's another question here, which I think is pertinent to, to what you were saying about the fact that at the moment, furloughs are a bit all or nothing. It's like you're either working for the company or you're furloughed and that's sort of the, the line. And then you can have that negotiation about whether you can or can't work for somebody else um, during that time if your employer is happy for you to. So specific question regarding um, networking. Can somebody do any form of networking for their business? I'm assuming the answer would be not, but that's the question. Well, the rule that the government have... <sighs> sort of the criteria they've introduced is not if it's fee generating, it cannot generate income for the business. And I would argue that networking is designed to, you know, make contacts with a view to generating business, uh, you know, business for your employer. So I would personally not do that. Um, if it's just a general network, but if it's designed that you're introducing yourself, this is who I am, this is who I work for, like most networking groups are, then you're actually selling, aren't you, on behalf of the business and you're trying to generate income and that's against the rule. So I would say not in that instance. Okay, so um, I hope that helps. That came from an anonymous attendee, so I'm afraid I can't use your name, but um, I hope that, that <laughs> answers your question. And again, we will keep you updated as this stuff comes through. We're doing at least weekly updates on everything that's changing so rapidly in the environment at the moment. So if you want to sign up for any of those things, Daisy, my colleague, will be posting some links about how you can sign up for, um, for contact with us in terms of workshops, in terms of things that can address your key business needs. And if you just want to get on our email lists and stay up to date with the latest information that we're keeping on top of for the centre and for our members. So thank you very much. If you've got more questions from Monica, keep them coming in the chat because I will come back to them later. Um, for now, I'm probably going to hand over, I think, to Anne Faye, just for her to talk to us a little bit about, you know, this, this, this word that we've come up with of, of, of furlough and what's been happening during this period, both in time, terms of the people who've gone on to furlough and are kind of coming up with ideas because of the possible anxiety of not having a, a job to go back to, and the people who are coming up with new ideas and, and new thoughts on the way of the world as a result of the fact that they've got more time than they would otherwise have been having. And so they're sort of musing on things as they're, as they're doing and they're having a daily routine that isn't their normal daily, possibly busy, um, established routine. And what's that's allowing to start to emerge in terms of what people are thinking about business possibilities, work possibilities, um, you know, the proliferation of digital innovation that we've seen in the last few weeks. So um, at that point, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to um, Anne Faye. And if you've got any specific questions, keep them coming in the panel and I will make sure that we, we, we deal with them for you. So. And Faye, over to you. I'm just checking that I haven't left myself on mute. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> Particular thing that I still want to know. Good. <laughs> so um, there's, there's been a lot of press coverage, I think because the press rightfully are looking for good news stories more than anything else, but also because we have seen similar phenomena before where necessity has been the mother of invention. So global upheaval does spawn new products and innovations. Um, the current burst of creativity may eventually compare to that seen during World War II, when companies, governments and scientists embarked on projects that had lasting consequences, is um, some of the coverage from Reuters. Technology used to help guide rockets eventually led to the first satellites and putting men on the moon. Um, Kane Kramer, who is the inventor and co-founder of the British Inventors Society, says there's no question that inventors will be coming up with hundreds, if not thousands, of new ideas. Everyone's down tools and they're only picking them up to fight the virus. It's a global war. I think it's really helpful at this stage to just look at the size of the, the amount of people that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, according to the ONS, 27% of the UK workforce is currently furloughed. That's over one in four employees. And obviously, as Monica was saying, the, the scheme has now been extended to October. So I think we're, in, we're inevitably going to see some activity and innovations and disruptions and changes from this massive, massive alteration and all of these workers who are now basically grounded. Um, we also looked at the data asking people across the board what they're doing with their lockdown time. Um, really nicely, the top activity for those who have them was that they were actually spending more time with their children, which I think is really important. I think it's going to be quite sobering for a lot of workers going back to work who have spent the time with their kids to actually reflect on that. Um, but also we are seeing quite high data points for creativity and for new skills. So nearly one in five 
people in the UK said that they were doing more arts and crafts. Um, nearly one in 10, which I think is really high, said that they were learning a new skill and 6% um, said that they were learning a new language. So creativity is definitely being driven in this context. Um, anecdotally, people are talking about a marked growth in creativity when the world turns upside down, says Professor Peter O'Connor at the Auckland University. Um, we often turn to the arts and that's what we're doing at the moment and it's fascinating. Um, nicely, there's, there's um, I think 45,000 hashtags for banana bread on um, Instagram at the moment. But also we are getting again at an anecdotal level evidence that people are using their time to actually make things and develop products. So a number of law, law firms have recently told the Daily Telegraph that April was one of the busiest months in their sector. One law firm was quoted as saying there has been an increase in to-do lists being completed. I think one of the main reasons is that people are sitting at home bored and are actually putting more effort into things they should have got on with in the previous six months to a year. So a lot of people that have had side hustles or things that they've always really wanted to do or that as we often see at the Innovation Centre, someone who's just had an idea that they've always wanted to have the time to work on and here's their chance. Um, we're also seeing some very, very meaningful um, and important innovation that's coming from a grassroots level. So I'm sure many people on the on the call are aware of the huge grassroots efforts in the maker and fashion communities at the moment to make scrubs for health workers. Um, one such collective is the love of scrubs, where volunteers up and down the country are sewing scrubs, scrub bags, ear protectors and non medical grade face masks. Um, there's a London-based designer called Steve Brooks who's filed a patent for a hygiene hook which allows users to pull open doors without having to touch them. Um, he's now in discussion with at least one NHS hospital to design something similar for pushing doors open. We're also seeing surprising pivots and interesting innovations. So there is a sex toy manufacturer called CMG Leisure who um, are used to using their 3D printer to make sex toys. But they're now making ear savers for key workers. So there's little bits of plastic that basically pull the pull the elastic round so that it doesn't actually start to um, create friction. Uh, we're also seeing Etsy is one of the massive success stories of this period. Um, 50,000 Etsy sellers have now sold at least one fabric face mask and 10,000 have sold over 100. Josh Silverman, who is the CEO of Etsy, um, spoke to the FT and said, I woke up to discover it was suddenly like Cyber Monday, but everyone in the world wanted only one product. Now, with regards, and I saw, I saw in the chat that, um, I think it was Sally, um, asking about how to engage with employees during this time and possibly even um, tap into this creativity that we have observed and the need to actually make things and do things and potentially upskill. Um, and Monica, please interject at this stage. Um, but according to the government furloughed employee government side, Fellows employees can engage in training as long as in undertaking the training the employee does not provide services to or generate revenue for or on behalf of their organization or a link to an associated organization. Fellows employees should be encouraged to undertake training. And again, at SYNC, we're seeing this anecdotally. We are seeing companies who are maybe in hibernation and have had to put their their employees on furlough they're actually taking the opportunity to develop those employees and it's a really good way of maintaining contact um keeping them motivated um giving them something to do but also of massive potential benefit to the business so employees can undertake job related training um upskilling could include job or industry specific training courses and free online courses um, many of which have got some more details that we can share after the webinar <laughs> There's also some very good lessons from, um, sad to say, previous pandemics. So, for example, during the Ebola crisis, a company operating in West Africa set a goal of rapidly improving its post-crisis performance. It executed a large-scale skill strategy that made the return to the physical workplace smoother. It introduced new skills and training that boosted performance and, last but not least, worked to create a more engaged workforce. Um, and I, again, I can share the full article from um, McKinsey that this came from. What I think is really interesting about what this company did is that they distinguished between critical and non-critical skills for the return and realized that its workforce was lacking flexibility. It then moved upskill, it moved to upskill people in adjacent skill areas. For, for instance, truck drivers learned how to be excavator operators. And what that meant is that when they returned, the employers were the employees were a lot more agile and the organization was as a result. So I think there's a really useful learning in that particular example. 
And then just some examples of online courses. I mean, they are myriad businesses that will offer online, free online learning now, Skillshare, Coursera, Udemy, e-learning center, LinkedIn Learning and Card Academy. Um, one that I've even seen this week is um, Recruitment Network, the Dots is running a series of web training webinars for free all of next week with really basic but very um, future-proofing skills such as um, learning to code and un under understanding Instagram. And I think what's very powerful about how they've done it is the learning to code um, course is gonna be run by Google. The Instagram course is gonna mm -hmm. be run by Instagram um, because obviously they, they work with those companies to recruit and so they have the relationship to do that. So I think it's, as an employer, it's about keeping keeping your eyes out and seeing that, that you know there's there's some fantastic things being offered there um, for free because a lot of businesses are using this time to promote what you know their contacts and what they're good at. So that, I mean that's very pertinent, isn't it? If, if if as Monica says, you're not actually allowed to go and do anything that that is is revenue generating for yourself or your business under furlough unless you've got specific agreement from your employer. That that you know employers looking out for what courses are now out there for free that can be upskilling my workforce for when they do come back is a is a really great takeout, isn't it? In terms of what um, employers can be doing both to keep in touch with their staff, but also to be upskilling them, actually upskilling them whether they do come back to that company or whether they do go to another company. They're still you know highlighting to those staff those skills and those programs. Yeah, definitely. Mandatory training is something that a lot of my clients have to do and it's, it's an opportunity for them. It's one of these things that always kind of you struggle to get your staff to keep on top of it. So mandatory training is definitely something if there's any employers out there that have mandatory training for their staff to do, even if it's somewhere down the line, use the opportunity now to get them to do that. But as Anne Faye said, there's lots of free courses out there. I know the Open University have extended their courses and lots of sort of short courses that you can learn various skills in business. Um, sales, marketing, arts, all different areas. So as an individual on furlough, great opportunity to upskill yourself. But also, Monica, are these, those, kind of, um, those kind of online training courses, are furloughs employees allowed to attend those together? Because I think one of, one of the things that I think that we've observed about this phenomenon of, of furloughing, you know, one in four employees, is it's really isolating to people who are used, particularly to people who are used to working in teams. Is, is online training in particular an opportunity for people to, you know, to get back together as a, as a team and do something constructive together? It certainly can be, but I would um, certainly advocate any employer that's got staff on furlough should be keeping in contact with them as much as possible and having, you know, you can have meetings. They don't need to be under the banner of work. So you can just have a catch up on a, you know, once a week, once a fortnight basis. But to sort of check in with staff on furlough, I think is very, very important. And that should be happening anyway. And again, you know, if you want to come to us with any questions about how you can do that, drop us a note in chat and Daisy and I will pick that up at the end and come back to you in terms of the ways that we're doing it, the ways that our members are doing it. And if you need any help on that, just let us know. There's a question here actually, before I come to you, Jeremy, um, for, from Ali Waters, uh, which is kind of about repeat furloughing. Uh, I think it's a really interesting question. Can you, can you be furloughed for three weeks, then go into work for a few days and then go back into furlough? Yes, that is the um, rather ridiculous situation that we're in now. And I think that's why the government is going to be changing the scheme to make it more flexible so that you don't have to do this on and off furlough just to get your employee to do some work for you. Okay. Um, and again, Sally's specific question there in terms of people attending seminars, webinars and workshops. That sounds like it's okay, Sally, as long as there's not an overt element of revenue generating networking in them. Um, I'll come back to some more questions, but I want to introduce um, Jeremy. Well, I'm going to let Jeremy introduce Jeremy, actually. But Jeremy's got a very interesting story of how um, he founded his business at a time of um, significant challenge. Meanwhile, if you've got any questions for Anne Faye, start posting those in chat. Um, otherwise, I'm going to hand over to you, Jeremy. Thank you. How long did you, how long have I got? Ten minutes. Um, start and let's see. Just to do that if I carry on. <laughs> yeah, because it'll be really obvious from the chat what people are asking the questions about and yeah, what they're yeah, interested yeah. in. And, and my guess, knowing your story, is that there's going to be a lot of interest. So. Cool. Hello, everyone. My name's um, Jeremy Jacobs. I am the um, I say founder, but my mum's listening. She's on the list, so I'll say co-founder because uh, <laughs> she started the business uh, with me eleven years ago. So the business that I'm talking about is um, Ray's Bakery. Um, we're a wholesale manufacturer based in Worthing. Uh, I live in Hove. 
and um, I do a couple of other bits on the side. So I'm a part-time um, MBA student at Sussex University, about halfway through my course, um, which has uh, been very interesting having to go from face-to-face -face lectures to online. It's been quite challenging. Um, and I also um, started a business recently called Cookie Jar Consultancy. So I'm helping businesses to succeed essentially. And what we were having a chat earlier and, and what's really important for me and why I'm doing these sorts of things is that I uh, wanted to work for myself for many years before I did. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that came about and why it's relevant to, to today. Um, but I love working for myself. And whilst it presents many challenges, um, I have a life that I love because of it. And when I started the business originally, um, I didn't have access to the level of support that I think that people starting their own business do today. And it's fantastic. You know, there's some really great initiatives. I'm a um, volunteer my time to be a mentor, a mentor at um, Virgin Startup. Um, I did some work with Entrepreneurial Spark years ago. Um, and also entrepreneur in residence at uh, the Met College in Brighton. Um, so I'm really passionate about, you know, sharing my story um, to hopefully inspire others to do the same, um, but also provide support because I know that when you first start your business, you know, you're expected to know so much and a lot of it is very daunting, particularly things like finance and HR or anything to do with legal it can be quite scary and that's why we have uh, experts like Monica to provide, you know, to provide that support. Um, but it can be very daunting. So I like to think that I hold people's hands through those early stages or not even early stages at any point in their business. So a little bit about Ray's Bakery and that's kind of what I wanted to focus on um, because uh, we started the business in the period of the 2008, 2009 financial crash. And I don't want to talk too much about what's going on now, but we've had to pivot our business very significantly in the past few weeks as a result of the, um, you know, the obvious, uh, it, you know, what's going on with COVID-19 and uh, the financial issues we're having at the moment. And the thing that I was thinking about earlier and what, what's really um, important is that um, these periods are actually really great time to start to start a business and a lot of people might disagree with me or think I'm crazy but I've kind of proven it twice now and the main reason is that I see that in those two periods what happened was I had nothing to lose like I'd lost my job so prior to starting Ray's Bakery I worked as a digital marketer in digital marketing um, in a local company and I'd worked up in London and I was building my career up and it was going really well and then the financial crash happened and I um, took voluntary redundancy from my job as an account director for a company called iCrossing and had nothing like I didn't have a job I had a little bit of money and um, and and that's what kind of started the business this I've got nowhere else to go. I could choose right now. I've got a choice. I can either go and get another job doing what I was doing, or there's this opportunity to, to go and do something that I've wanted to do for years. But having the um, pressure of needing to have an income always kept me in that place. Now, just for context, I'm single and I don't have any kids. I've got a dog who you might see wandering around in the background, but I don't have any dependents. So I guess in that respect, I, I'm fortunate in that I don't have anyone to look after them myself. So it's, it's slightly easier. So I get, you know, there might be some people listening that have children, you know, you have a family and it's really important to consider that. Um, but I really saw, and in this moment now, you know, everything had been stripped away. And I was like, well, I've, I've got no, I've got no choice. I can either, I, you know, I can do whatever really. It kind of opened up this space for me to just like a blank canvas with my life go, okay, what do I want to do now? Now there might be some people who are listening that are furloughed and expect to go back to work, but I've been asked a lot about what I've seen in the business world in terms of what changes I've seen. And there's this real stripping away of this kind of, making it, being successful, looking good, that I know for myself, 
you know, when I'm dealing in business, there's, there's this pride and all of that sense. And that's kind of been taken away. And I've had some really deep and very kind of human conversations with some of my customers. And lots of positive things have come out of a very, very concerning and worrying and challenging time. I'm a natural optimist, so I always look for the good in stuff. So just coming back to Rose Bakery, so I started, we started the business in 2008, 2009, in this period of the financial crash, as I explained, and we've grown the business, and I'm not going to go into detail about that journey. Um, I mean, just to give you a, a brief background, so a few years in, we won a contract to supply Virgin Atlantic. So we had to upscale our business, um, which was still in my mum's kitchen to some extent, um, to making about uh, seven, about fifty-five to seventy-five thousand cupcakes a week um, for fifteen daily flights out of London for Virgin. So in the eighteen-month period that we um, that we worked with them, we served just under four million cupcakes. Um, and off the back of that, we set up our own production facility, which we still have in Worthing. Um, and we've been there for about six years now. And there's been lots of, you know, the normal kind of like roller coaster journey of running your own business. We've developed a range of um, eight products for a uh, supermarket, a chain of supermarkets. And then six weeks later, they pulled the plug and I had to like send six members of staff home and undo this like 18 months of work, um, you know, all those kinds of challenges. But what's happened now is um, a, probably about 80%, and I know some of you will be going, well, that's not a very good idea to have 80% of your turnover in two customers, but that's the way it was. Um, uh, one of them was a travel customer, and the other one was a, customer, a retail customer that has um, outlets in shopping malls, so I doesn't take a genius to work out what happened to them literally overnight all of our income stopped like and and actually all of our other customers stopped so we lost a hundred percent of our turnover in 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 a manner of days um and it and it kind of was a bit it kind of got a bit blindsided by it, it kind of was trying and my optimism was probably a little bit too optimistic i was like oh, i was gonna be fine actually it wasn't um so we followed our team They've all been furloughed. And again, I've come back to this period where I'm like, I've got, you know, I've got nothing. Like my business is, is completely collapsed overnight. I still have all of these financial commitments. Luckily, you know, um, you know, the government has supported us in, in furloughing our team. I think it would be a very different story if they hadn't. So I'm irrespective of your, uh, you know, whether or not you like the Tories, uh, I'm very grateful for that. Um, and, yeah, and the other thing which which was which I bang on about to to people who who run their own business is you don't understand your finances. Understand your finances. It's the most critical thing I believe in any business. Understand where your money's going, where you're spending it, how much you've got in the bank, because um, just very briefly, we opened a retail shop in Hove about four years ago, and we closed it after two years. It wasn't working for us, and we were left with. Um, I'm quite open with figures we were left with about 150,000 pounds worth of debt which for the business at the time was a huge amount um, and it still is a huge amount of money and um, we wiped the slate clean and we closed the shop and we started from scratch again actually so this is technically our third time won a new contract and built the business up and we got got to a point where like we cleared all that debt we have money in the bank and then this happens um, I'm not a believer of fate, but some people who might be would think, well, you know, because I'd said, oh, everything's going really well, and then <laughs> this happens. Um, but uh, what what has saved us is that I, because I'd been through that experience, I was super clear. I was like, I need money in the bank to run the business with no income for at least four months. And we just got to that point. So for us as a business, fortunately, because I put those protections in place, we're not in a particularly bad pos position. I was like, okay, you know, uh, cut cost cutting exercise, cut every single cost I could out of the business as quickly as possible. Did a cash flow forecast for three months and looked at it all and I'm like, okay, I think I'm okay. So what what what's happened? Uh, I was sat at home one day and. Um, my face uh, the street had set up a Facebook group 
and I had loads of flour at home. Now, if anyone, you don't even have to be a baker to know that like the country has run out of flour. Like Did he a, a surplus of flour. <laughs> oh, we've got loads of it, and and the and the reason for it was is that two uh, percent, is it four percent of all flour production goes to retail? The ninety six percent goes to manufacturing, and a lot of manufacturers were still buying that flour. There's only fourteen mills in the country that can retail pack flour, and they just were they just couldn't keep up with demand. You know, the increase in demand from from customers wanting to bake at home, and you know, a lack of supply coming in. So. I was like, well, I've got loads of flour in my bakery. So I, someone had asked about flour. So I messaged and said, oh, I've got flour. Um, you know, if you want some, let me know. And they'll say, I'll give you some money for it. I felt, not that, I felt like I'm like a bit of a drug dealer, like running <laughs> bags of white powder around my streets. But people were like really <laughs> desperate for it. And they were like, someone offered to pay me 10 pounds for a kilo of white flour which was crazy. I'm not that ruthless. So I said, no, I'm not taking that much. But um, it gave me it gave me an idea. I was like, right, OK, let's let's see if we can do this, um, uh, you know, uh, commercially. So drawing on my um, digital marketing skills. So I, I know how to build websites. Pretty easy for me. Um, within 24 hours, we had a site up and running with all of our flour, all of our sugar, probably about 15 products. Um, we did a Facebook advertising campaign and put a picture of empty shelves and said, uh, supermarkets out flour, basically we've got some. Um, and then I started doing a Google AdWords campaign because that's what I used to do in my previous uh, job. So I'm, I'm very skilled at that. And I'm, I'm overwhelmed with the response. I've got 10 staff in our bakery at the moment um, packing flour all day and we can't keep up. Um, we've sold, I think, about six tons of flour, um, and if we, we're kind of waiting for the the drop off when supply starts to come back, we know that it it won't always be this way. But if we can, if we extrapolate out what we've earned in this uh, first part of May, we'll be exceeding our income like almost double what we were bringing in from our other customers. It's insane. Um, and we've now uh, built the pro we're building the products out. So I think we've probably got about 25, 30 products on there now. And we're selling basically everything that we buy in, excuse me, to the public retail package, professional grade, a lot of the stuff you can't buy in shops. Um, and our aim is to be way more price competitive. So now we've got an arm of the business that we didn't, I, you know, I've, I've wanted an online shop for ages and not had the time to do it. And now we have. So the plan is that when our other customers come back, we will continue to build on that and have a completely new arm of our business that we didn't have before, um, which is, yeah, pretty fantastic. Which is amazing, isn't it? Because that's actually going to make your business a lot more resilient than being in, so financially dependent on two major retailers if you've yes. got that balance. So again, in terms of your, your longer term business strategy to, to risk reduce, which you'd already done a lot of stuff towards in terms of giving yourself that four month runway. Yes. Now again, with that diversification, that's building in significant resilience for the future through that pivot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, I was acutely aware for years that having all of our um, eggs in one basket, so to speak, was, was very risk, risky for us. Um, so I have been working on it, but you're absolutely right. We've, we've, we've done that, you know, again, but with a completely different market and it helps to build our brand. So we won uh, a grant from Costa Capital to help develop retail wrapped products. So things like cookies and, and whatnot in retail packaging that we will plan to sell into supermarkets. But it means that we can start to build a community of people around our business. Um, we have a mission um, that every human eats well. Uh, sorry, our vision is that every human eats well and our mission um, is to be the planet's best love bakery, one that gives back more than it takes from its people, environment and community. And so it's very important to us that this, the business um, that gives back more. So the other thing to mention is that for every order placed, um, we're going to be donating food to local food banks or community groups as well. That was done at that was done as a short term thing in terms of um, what's going on with COVID-19. But the plan is to actually make that part of our offering. Um, and we're going to be looking at other things that we can do um, 
you know, to support the community because I, I, I'm really passionate about businesses doing good for the planet and not just take, 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 mm -hmm. take, take. It's also really interesting what you said about how having had the idea and observed that there was an addressable market for your flower that you then used the online tools that you're really familiar with that, that are also quite accessible um, yeah. to just to just drive purchase and we're we're putting a, we're putting a lot of emphasis on because there's a lot of businesses that are pivoting there are lots of businesses that are pivoting but i think they're really struggling to on unlock the potential of online so yeah. it, it'd be really helpful if you could just talk really briefly in layperson's terms about how how that kind of like that digital marketing was was a key part of the mix yeah, I mean, it's all about, I mean, um, one of the things that I was, I learned in one of my modules at the MBA was we were talking about market share and how the most effective way to get market share is to buy it effectively. And this is essentially what we're doing. So um, the great thing, as you say, the barriers to um, using uh, online tools like Google AdWords or Facebook um, are very low because they obviously want as many people to use their services as possible. So um, the great thing about Facebook is that we're able to target very specific groups. It's really good for targeting very specific people. So for example, we targeted uh, initially women between the age, I think it was 25 to 65. I didn't, I don't, anyone in between, over the, I don't take offense, I just like picked a group. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, then I, and then I looked and targeted, if they had an interest in baking. Um, and then people started sharing that, commenting, liking it, sharing it with friends. And then something that happened outside of our control was, um, was that people started sharing it on community groups. So if I had the time, I'd probably be engaging with community groups online locally to, to, um, to do that. It's important to mention also, we already had an existing relationship with a courier company. So we, we were able to get that set up extremely quickly. Um, and then Google AdWords, again, very easy to do. My only biggest piece of advice is really be careful about your targeting because Google AdWords, when you set it up as a lay person, will set you up in this kind of like easy mode and it can really make, it can just rip your budget, you know, spend so much money. So you have to use, I use very targeted keywords and called what's called broad match and phase match. So it, my ad only shows if they type that exact term in and then I'm very specific about what I actually target. Um, so that makes it cheaper. Um, but you know, it's not, it's not, it's not cheap. We're spending about 100 to 150 pounds a day um, on that, but it's generating enough revenue so we can see our return on investment um, and things like that. So lots of questions coming in here about how we can buy your flower, Jeremy. Do you want to give us the web address? Yeah, you can, absolutely. So it's shop, I'll, I'll type it in here, but it's shop.raisebakery.com. Um, and yeah, we have, a, we have an army of people packing flowers. So if anyone needs flour, then uh, you can go, I'm, I'm not sure you can get your flower it. here. Yeah, it's interesting what you were saying about how consolidated that milling industry is. Because I was talking to a friend in Dublin last week and she'd been trying to get flour and she'd eventually managed to get some marriages flour, which I happen to know yes. is in Essex, yes. in Dublin. Yeah. And, she'd, and she'd managed to get hold of it through the informal economy, not through any exchange of money, but by swapping it for some sushi rice. Right. So it's, it's quite interesting what's going on. You know, I'm hearing a lot of those stories. About yeah, like people are trading. Yeah. I mean, when was the last time we bartered anything? You know, I, uh, you know, there was during, a, during, the, during the recession. <laughs> yeah, so there was a you know, great loo roll shortage, and people were like trafficking loo roll. And then after that, there was the great sh compost shortage, and I was trafficking compost up and down the street. And I'm like, I've got 20 bags. Who wants some compost? Um, no, it's really and now good. it's better, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's also we uh, we we I can get a lot of stuff for free in exchange for cake. Um, we had thirty thousand pounds worth of stock returned to us by one of our customers, so we're actually selling our cakes online as well because we've got to try and shift it. Um, but yeah, we we uh, we only accept hot, cold hard cash. I'm afraid we don't accept offers of. <laughs> of bartering. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's yeah. So yeah, it's been yeah, it's been an interesting journey. Okay, so I'm going to try something new here, which is I've just created the first ever Sussex Innovation webinar poll, and, and Anne Fay is probably going to have my guts for garters in terms of its uh, lackadaisical research questionnaire, but I'm going to launch a poll. 
saying, has anybody started a new skill or hobby during COVID-19? So let's see if this works, what people have been up to. So while you're filling that in, I've never done this before, that's quite exciting. Um, oh, lots of baking, there we go, you're, you're on the money, Jeremy. Get your flower here, sewing, music. Others, let us know in the chat what you're doing if you're not sewing, baking or singing, sorry. S I know my one, I'm not gonna do it for you. I can do a handstand, headstand. I've taught myself to do a headstand from like, just a, from normal, do you know what I mean? Like not throwing myself up, just doing a headstand. That's headstand. it. Headstand. <laughs> Is that headstand on its own or part of? No, just, no, I do yoga and Pilates. So I was okay. just doing a random, I was like, I want to do a handstand and I can. I'm quite pleased with myself. Okay, I didn't put gymnastics on the list. I'll know that for next time. And Faye, you can teach me better. Homeschooling, digital painting, cycling, art. So um, yeah, lots of proliferation of those creative arts. We'll have to see how we can bring that kind of stuff back into the center when we come back. So oh, someone's just said, someone's just said that, um, Flowers sold out. Don't worry, that will be sorted in about. It's selling out so quickly. It's crazy. Um, the other thing we're going to um, plan to do um, is next week is um, we're going to do online baking um, webinars or live streams, um, but we're also going to sell the ingredients. <laughs> so we're going to teach people how to bake cookies, but then if they want to, they can buy the kit then we'll send it to them for it so then they can come online and learn how to bake with us. A lot of baking happening. So there we go, there is a lot of baking happening. I've just shared the results. That do you have, the crucial question, do you have yeast as well? We do, yes. We do. I'm just actually, uh, just, this is the beauty. So um, just also actually to mention, we, um, we use um, Shopify um for our web to set the website up but um i hear that wix uh w i x dot com wix is a more um user friendly version if you're not very technical shopify could be a little bit more technical to set up but um i've been told wix apparently which you can do an online store with um it's very easy to do so um you know go and check that out if you're interested we set a lot of wix websites up at, at sync yeah, uh, you know, if it's something that you're looking for for your business or somebody you know has got a business where they're still looking for support to go online and leverage online, because there's also a difference, right, Jeremy, in terms of building the website and then actually getting the publicity out. So there's those two chunks. It's like just building the website isn't going to start selling you flour or paper. No, 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 definitely not. Yeah, you need people. You're not going to, you're not going to get, um, you're not going to be able to get on like all the sort of search engine searches through SEO. You know when you just first start out it's just gonna be impossible um so you have to unfortunately you have to pay for it i mean the other thing which is a little uh tip which um i figured out um is if you go onto twitter you might already know this go onto twitter and search for things like flower shortage then it will bring up all of the tweets that are related to people saying they can't get flour and then i literally went through the copied and pasted a response in and people shared it so that's another free way that you could get you know yourself out there without having to pay for it yeah that's thank you that's helpful right but so also, have we got any sorry just really additionally um just really quickly on your point about um social media channels and facebook and the like wanting people to spend money with them um I found out today that Instagram is actually kind of lowering its prices at the moment because obviously they're going after all of the um, paid media that's probably coming off newspapers and also right. a big opportunity for Instagram to grab share, right? Yeah, definitely. So you might find that Instagram is much more reasonably priced at the moment than you may have found it in the, in the past and more accessible. Yeah, we, we run ours. Um, I, mean, um, we, I mean, we spend, I would say Facebook, uh, would be a would be a cheaper option you're not without going into too much detail the the kind of the thing behind it um facebook is a, is what they call kind of like display targeting so you're targeting your message to someone that isn't necessarily looking for it at that point the great thing about adwords is is that people are searching for your term they are actively looking for your product or service so your conversion rate which is the rate at which the person coming through actually buys 
um, is going to be quite high. So uh, this might have changed. I've been out of the industry for a while, but the average decent conversion rate is probably around about one and a half to three percent. We're getting about ten to fifteen percent at the moment. Um, mm. So Facebook is is you're going to be showing your ads to people that m might not be actually looking for your product, um, but they will share it. Um, and they'll know about you if you're, you know, and it, and it actually works a lot, a lot cheaper. So we only, I think we've only probably spent about 200 pounds with Facebook over this whole period. Whereas we're probably talking a few thousand with uh, Google AdWords. And that, and that landscape of people and how people are sharing social media seems to have changed so dramatically during this thing, because it's, we've been doing a lot of work with community groups, with people who are supporting food banks, homeless people, you know, all of those kind of really fundamental grassroots organisations. And it's really interesting. I, 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 you know, have some involvement with a, um, a singing group where we used to do real life choirs singing together. Yeah. Um, we took that online within the first two weeks and we would have done paid for um, targeted Facebook for business back end campaigns and got maybe reach of 200 to 500 people on a, on a standard campaign, which was, which we thought was reasonably good. And within yeah. the first three weeks, we were just getting shared so much by virtue of there being an online choir that people were saying, oh my God, this is giving us a highlight in our week, that we were up to 10,000. Wow. Yes. And it, it, organic reach just people yeah, sharing yeah, yeah. not us paying and it was just a massive shift so our bra the brand awareness went from absolutely nothing to oh my god there's this amazing place that you can come and come and sing in a way we could never have imagined mm. yeah never. definitely yeah no it's very interesting the other thing as well which i just i, I was writing um I was writing a um thing for uh, my son for my uh, mba and it was around um, I had to do strategy and, and I was interested uh, about this and it'd be interesting to see if anyone agrees that um, you'll either have an, you'll either have a really great idea, business idea, not know how to execute it, or you've got a really, um, sorry, hold on. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah. Or the other way around, which is where people are so desperate to work for themselves that they'll do anything and they, they'll, they'll have the confidence, but they don't have a great idea and it's it's finding that sweet spot between and often i find a lot of people don't have the confidence they've got an idea they just don't know where to start and it's where people like myself and lots of entrepreneurs out there will offer um you know their, their time um to support that so there's actually a question here on, on that note jeremy charlotte said picked you up on something that you said earlier which is jeremy said there were two good points that, to start a business one is yeah. when you've got nothing to lose, but what's the other one? Did I say that? I oh, know I may I might have been referencing the fact that there were two points in my life where I'd started. I think that's maybe oh, what yeah. I meant. I've got a terrible memory, so I might have gone. Um, no, that, that I think I might have. I don't know. Charlotte might be able to. Yeah, I think that's what I meant. Okay. Um, you know. Yeah, there was another point actually. I was reading here that. Uh, no. You carry on. I thought I was going to say something else. Okay, we might come back to you in a moment. We've got um, another question here in terms of furloughing. Back to you, Monica, really. Um, can, what, what, what is the advice in terms of, um, oh, this one comes up for us quite a lot. Um, enforcing holiday or infer, enforce, uh, encouraging people to take some of their holiday while they're on furloughs and, and, you know, the plans to allow holiday to be spread over more than one year when people come back. Can you just do us a quick summary on that? Yeah, um, the, certainly. The understanding is that the uh, 5.6 weeks annual leave that full-time employees are entitled to minimum, maybe more dependent on your contract of employment, um, the government will allow the statutory part of that to be carried forward. So if you give an employee 30 days leave plus bank holidays, 20 of those days plus bank holidays, um, that entitlement the government is planning on allowing to be extended for two annual leave years so if they don't take it in this year your year ends you know annual leave year ends at the end of august they may be taking holiday from this year as far into 2022 um, what a lot of employers are doing and i actually recommend that you give this consideration is under the working time regulations, employers can request that employees take holidays at certain times. Typically in a contract of employment, it's good to put that in the holiday clause to say, 
that as the employer, you reserve the right to request that the individual take holiday at specific times. Sometimes it may be over the Christmas period, there may be other closure periods that are relevant to your industry. But a clause like that is helpful. But even without that clause, under the working time regulations, employers can give notice to an employee to take holiday at a particular time, and that can happen during furlough leave. What you have to do is give twice as much notice as the length of time you want the employee to take off. So if you want the employee to take a week off at the first week of June, then you know before 10 days before the end of May, you need to issue the written notice to that individual to say, can you take annual leave at that particular time? The only thing I would say to that, and I think it's good for employers to be mindful of, this is a very strange time. Employees are at home, not really enjoying themselves in a lot of situations, sometimes working from home, finding it quite challenging, a lot of things to juggle. So I've always, you know, the employers that have spoken to me about it, I've recommended just think about giving that individual time when we are released a little bit more from this lockdown so they can do what they want to do as opposed to making them take holiday while they're restricted can't really do a great deal with it and then when they get get back to work and they think right i want to have a bit of time to have a bit of normality before i throw myself back in they've got no holiday or you don't want them to take holiday so as much as i absolutely appreciate the need to reduce the holiday as much as possible and doing it in furlough i would also say consider you know try and leave the employees some that if they do come back to work um, when restrictions are lifted then they do have the option of using some holiday in the way that they want to with a bit more flexibility the only thing i would add to that is if you're paying your um furloughed worker 80 percent you have to pay the holiday at the normal remuneration so that's at the 100 percent rate you cannot pay them their holiday pay at the 80% reduced rate that you may be paying them during their furlough leave. Thank you for that. I hope that clarifies. Then there's a question um, here from Jenny in terms of how how people um, how do people get in touch with the volunteer activities? I think probably what the best thing to do on that one is is that we will um, send some follow up to this meeting, um, asking you know what you got out of it, but also with some of these links that you're asking for in that email. So. There's various different volunteer activities that we can um, connect you to. So if Daisy, that's something that we can do after this, I think that would be great. Um, still got questions coming in. So thank you all so much for um, uh, being so participative. No, I think that is actually, I think we're done. We've got three minutes to spare. If anybody's got one last question, please do feel free to jump in. Um, While you're waiting for that to come in, sorry, Helen, it was just, it was quite interesting listening to um, the story of Ray's Bakery and the issues that there and what Anne Faye was saying about, you know, innovation and creativity normally happens in a time of need because it's very similar to the reason that I started my business. I start, I actually took the opportunity to train, not to retrain, but to get the qualifications that I didn't have. I was doing the job for a credit management firm for 20 years. The latest recession, 2007, eight happened, completely changed the industry, lots of consolidation. I exited the business that I was working in and then spent time retraining, um, like they did an MBA, did the employment law qualification, and then started this business out of that. And, you know, at the moment, HR companies are something that's pretty busy because of everything that's going on. Um, so, you know, it's, it's actually benefited me in the long run but it was something that yeah it was an opportunity of do i go and continue to get a job in the industry or do i go and work for myself and use the opportunity of the recession to retrain and start my business so that's exactly how my business started so this is a great time for people to think about what they, <coughs> they want to do moving forward um, and you know we are doing a lot of that work are they helping people train up with skills or with brands or with business model canvases for businesses they might start in the future even if they're not um, starting them now so they've got them in their back pocket maybe in case they haven't got a job to go back to at the end of the furlough period so again if you um, have got staff or you know anybody who'd be interested in that kind of thing Daisy's posting some links but we'll also follow up and let you um, have a little bit more on this now I'm going to finish with the bumper slide that I was supposed to start with if I can effectively share my screen here just to let you know flower is now back on the website Flower <laughs> is back in stock so that's the beauty everybody. of having a, having a phone that you can do it right on there so so, um, 
Yeah, so, so thank you very much. Go by flower, you now know how to furlough and unfurlow people and refurlow people. You now got some of the ideas about the furlovation that's going on. We are continuing to look at the innovation that's going on at this time um, with a view to launching a white paper in the autumn to you know, help take our business community in and around Sussex through the things that we think are gonna be the trends that are gonna stick out of this. Um, so uh, that's it, I think, from today. I hope you um, learned something useful. I hope you can take that back to your businesses. Do come back to us if you've got any more questions. You know, Monica on the HR side, us on the insight side, Jeremy on the baking side. We look forward to uh, seeing the launch of your uh, online cooking, baking classes next week. Um, and yeah, just again to uh, finish with the Survive and Thrive slide and um, to say thank you uh, very much to Gatwick Diamond Business for doing these with us, to um, the EU fund that helps create these um, slots for you and to the government. So that is my uh, finishing slide. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jeremy, for joining us. Thank you, as always, Monica. Thank you, anne Fay for um, doing the insight work. And we will see you next week if you'd like to join us again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.